If we think about how we use music and why music can be something that helps us with stress, we could think about all the different ways in which we use music on a daily basis. We use music at home when we want to relax. For some people, they have music playing in the background. It actually helps them to concentrate. We use music for celebrations. Think about watching television. Every commercial you see on television has music in the background. When we go for, for romance, when we, when we watch movies, movies have music going on in the background that you're not even aware of. But if you pulled away that music, it would significantly alter your perception of that particular scene in the movie. Think about the movie Jaws. Steven Spielberg cleverly used the da dum da dum to really trigger an emotion. You didn't you heard that sound, just those two notes, and you knew something bad was about to happen. But music is used to alter our moods. It can increase our depression, it could increase our our happiness, it could increase arousal, it could decrease arousal. We use music in athletic locker rooms. I, I know there are some people who actually will play very slow-paced, relaxing music like that we'll talk about shortly in order to get the opposing team to be too relaxed and not hyped up enough to really perform. Music is present in shopping malls all the time. We don't even think about it, but it's there. And so we want to see how we can use music to help relieve a person's stress. Because if we can relieve the person's stress, we might change their physiology. On the screen right now, you're seeing the physiological effects of music, how music actually can change heart rate, blood pressure, respiration rate, muscle tension and the release of hormones. We want to see, can we use music in a way that makes our um, client with tinnitus feel more relaxed? Because if they feel more relaxed, they're going to be able to cope with their tinnitus in a natural way, in a natural habituation way that is advantageous to them. So the thing about music is that we as human beings have certain categorical expectations. We don't like the unexpected when it comes to music. However, certain rules that we'll talk about shortly have to be followed if the music is going to be pleasant for us. As I mentioned earlier, if we're dealing with tinnitus, we would like to not force our client into active listening. Rather, we would like to have our client use passive listening that soothes them, that relaxes them, and that induces habituation. Active listening can distract. Passive listening may allow for calmness, and even some, some studies have shown for increased cognitive function. We also know an important rule of music that has been verified in the, in the research literature is that recognizable and predictable music may have a tendency to induce active listening, whereas music or acoustic stimuli that are non-predictable but yet are still following the rules that make them pleasant to listen to can induce passive listening. And that's what our goal is. So for our people with tinnitus, we're going to really try to not draw their attention to the tinnitus. If they associate a certain song, for example, with the presence of tinnitus, that may draw their attention to the tinnitus. We want to use passive listening to hopefully facilitate habituation. So here's some of the rules of music that, we, that you might think about. Music that has a slower tempo, and by slower tempo, I mean something that beats a little bit slower than your heartbeat. You know, our, our pulse goes close to around 70, 72 beats per minute. If you use a tempo that is slower than that, as slow as 60 beats per minute, it tends to be very calming to many people. We know that slow onset and longer and quieter sounds tend to be calming. Abrupt, short, loud sounds tend to be alerting. So we might want to stay away from those. We don't want to try to calm a person down by having signals that change abruptly in terms of their loudness because that's going to draw their attention to it. And certainly for our uh, clients that have hearing loss and that have loudness recruitment, we really don't want to shoot in some unexpected loud sound 
uh, that's, un, that's coming out of nowhere. We also can follow rules of music that state that major chords tend to be associated with happiness, whereas minor chords tend to be associated with sadness. But as I will sh point out shortly, not everybody interprets these rules in exactly the same way. The rules you're seeing right now really apply to the majority of people, but people have various um, individual preferences. Well, before we go on with this, let's think about where music is processed in the brain. Now, I'm showing you a slide right now that indicates the various areas, and as you can see from this slide, music really activates a broad region of the brain. You know, certain language, for example, is focused in, for example, the auditory areas of the brain, in the temporal lobe, although depending on your emotional reaction to it and your logic, how you interpret that signal, there will be activation in other parts of your brain, such as your frontal lobe as well. But when you look at this slide and you look at music, you could see that music really activates a, a, almost the whole brain. It activates your emotions, it activates your um, um, memory associations, and so on. And in particular, I will draw your attention to the fact that music activates the hippocampus because of your uh, association with music as being something that's pleasant, as well as the amygdala, which again, if we trigger the amygdala in the proper manner, we're going to release certain neurotransmitters that provide us with pleasure. That There's a little spot on that this slide that shows the nucleus accumbens, which is an area of the limbic system that releases dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter associated with extreme pleasure. So we can induce pleasure or we can induce anxiety by using music. Again. Uh, an example of that anxiety was the music from Steven Spielberg's Jaws, where you induce anxiety because the person associates that music with something terrible is about to happen. So there's a number of ways we could deliver music to our clients. We could deliver music through the home stereo. We could deliver music using some kind of an MP3 player, an iPod, for example, something with, with headphones. We could use some form of acoustic desensitization by using um, commercial products that are like in the form of an iPod that, re that play recorded music and that even filter the music in accordance with the hearing loss. Or we could use hearing aids. And I hope to show you why the use of hearing aids is more conducive to delivering music as a relaxing stimuli for our hearing impaired people than these others. So first of all, as I mentioned earlier, everybody has individual preferences about music selection. What's very calming and, and relaxing to one individual may not create that same reaction to another individual. I actually once had a patient who I was play, uh, talking to them about a, a piece of music, a piece of classical music that I know is very calming for most people. And this patient actually told me that that was the music that was played at his father's funeral and so when he hears that music it creates great sadness for him. So if we use certain kinds of music we would like to be able to allow our client or our patient to select what is relaxing to them, what is soothing to them.